All right, you all. Um, welcome to our first Ask Me Anything panel of the great remote experience. Um, so we are kicking off, uh, I thought it'd be a good um, first topic for this series of Ask Me Anythings to have a team of some of our seasoned remoters um, and an HR perspective to chat a little bit about how to transition to remote life um, and how we are kind of all in this together and some helpful tips and tricks for um, starting out remote. So I'm first question is I want to introduce our panel. So we're joined by Keith McClellan, Raphael Poss, uh, Matt Petrie, Lauren Weber, and Bob Water. Um, so my first question for you all is just share uh, a little bit about your role at Cockroach and your uh, experience so far with remote work. So uh, let's start with Bob. Hi, I'm Bob Vauder. Thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Hey, very nice. Yeah, uh, I've been a full-time remote worker since 2008. And I've done uh, remote work uh, while I was at Google, based out of Atlanta, then a couple of different New York startups, and you know, been a cockroach for just a few years now. Awesome. Lauren? I worked remote once before in my life when I moved from San Francisco to New York and I continued working for my company that was headquartered out west. That was about a five month engagement. And this week is my, only my second experience. Um, I would say I'm not a self-described fan of this remote work environment. So I got to disclose that up front. We're, we're learning at the same time. Uh, Matt? Hi, y'all. I'm Matt Petrie, uh, based in Dallas Fort Worth area, and I've been uh, I'm on the sales team, um, and I've been working remote for about seven years, uh, mainly. And uh, most of the companies in software I've worked uh, for have been either Bay Area or or now New York, so they don't have a, a Dallas office. So uh, it gives me the opportunity to uh, work from home or a plane or an airport or wherever. Awesome, uh, Raphael. Uh, so I'm. I work from, from. I've been working from home for eight years, uh, including full time for Cockroach, Cockroach since uh, 2016, and um, I work in engineering. Awesome. And Keith. So I have been working remotely um, on and off since 2010. Uh, full time remote since 2013, and I'm on the solutions engineering team. Awesome. Well, thanks all for sharing. We have a great panel set up. So this is kind of to be honest, this is my first time working remote too. And I, I joked as we were getting started up that my uh, big thing about how to separate my work and non-work thing is I put on a tie today, I'm dressing up. So I'm curious for those of you with um, some, some seasoned history working remote, how do you set your schedule and how do you separate um, your work mindset and your work environment from your home mindset and home environment. Um, Keith's on my screen, so let's keep, kick it off with Keith. Yeah, so I have a separate workspace. For me, that's the most important thing. Um, it's having a space that I only use for work. If you don't have extra bedrooms or, or whatnot, then a desk or a corner of the room or whatever. Um, when I started working from home, I was in a one bedroom condo and I turned my dining room into a workspace. Um, so it, it's just a matter of, for me, it was always a matter of a place mm. more than, more than anything else. Gotcha. Raphael, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Um, I, I would concur with Keith, although I also have had a period where I was sharing a home with other students and I was working uh, from home and then you can't really have a separate space, but you can create the, uh, the feeling of a separate space by ensuring that you don't see your work stuff when you're not working. And you can solve this by either hiding your equipment or covering it. And I would recommend that for everyone with a small space to invest into uh, implements to um, uh, to create that that separation visually at least. 
And then um, it's the other thing that works pretty well. So even when I, I'm not forced to work remotely I, and I choose, for example, to take my laptop to the living room, there is the action of taking the laptop outside of uh, out of a closet or back into a closet that will create that separation very effectively. Gotcha. Any of our other panelists have any things? I'm curious, how do you separate that, that mindset um, outside of just the physical space? I think a lot of it has to do with, with also giving yourself permission to be off from work. That, that was one of the things that I struggled with years ago was I was working from my home and I had an office in the basement that was dedicated to work, but I could never give myself permission to, to actually be home. Gotcha. Okay. What, um, what changed? How did you allow yourself to give you that permission? It, it finally boiled down to one of my housemates saying, uh, you need to stop working. This is, <laughs> this is becoming problematic. You know, so that was, you know, that was something where I, I had to, to be okay with not being on 100% of the time. Yeah. To have a, a little mini intervention. A little bit, you know, but <laughs> I, I deal with my stress by working more. <laughs> There you go. This Matt. is Lauren. Oh. Lauren. Sorry. <laughs> I knew Matt and I were both trying to get in. So <laughs> I was going to say, you guys might have seen me run away really fast, but I have these blue blocking glasses that I have in the office and I never use them. And I decided this week I'm going to put the glasses on. And this is work, Lauren, now. And then if I take the glasses off, it's not work, Lauren. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. I've I've become work heaven. Uh, Matt. Yeah, I just I just wanted to you know agree with with Keith. Having doors is is great, uh, and if you can have a situation in your home or or wherever you are that you're you've got your own workspace. But even if you don't have doors, uh, you know certainly this week and and for the short term it's going to be a little different, but there've been times where just to get out of the house, I've reserved a room at the library or gone and worked from Starbucks uh, because working at home, you know, means working at home most of the time, but sometimes you just don't want to be at home. <laughs> and so, um, you know, just, just changing up your environment a bit uh, can be good. And, and, you know, in this week or, or the next week or however long it is going out to the car, if you've got a strong internet, connection in your garage or going out in the backyard and working from there, um, you know, might be the right thing to do. Um, and, and I just comment also on the tie. That's, that's awesome. When I, when I first transitioned into home office, I had worked for a company previously that was a very suit and tie culture. Um, I was at Oracle and, and, uh, you know, for the first probably year I, I worked from home in a suit and tie because that what, you know, that's what felt made it feel like, work time uh, for me. And, and at the end of the day, when you take that off, it, it also feels like you're, you're kind of ending your day. Now that wears off after a while. Uh, you, mm. you say, you know, <laughs> I don't necessarily want to pay for dry cleaning anymore. And ironing in the morning is not always that great and, and so forth. But it, it, it is a way to help kind of transition from one to the other. Awesome. Yeah, y'all yeah, find out. Oh. I was just going to say the the importance of ritual of I am I'm doing my go to work ritual which used to be I'd make coffee and I'd get the newspaper and I would, that would, that would put me into the work mode. And then when I was done with work for the day, I had my coming home ritual, which was going upstairs and making myself some decaf tea and, and drinking that and, and allowing myself to decompress and using that as my commute. Awesome. Bob, that actually brings up another question I had, cause I like that you mentioned a ritual and some of you all have hit on this. Do you, do you have any go to, rituals that you do and um also with those rituals how do you establish boundaries if you're living in a home with other folks i share my apartment with a roommate and it's great because she's also working remote right now so our kind of boundaries that we set are if i'm in my room because i'm in my bedroom right now that's our office essentially this is this is my outpost of cockroach labs her room is her outpost of data dog um so it's trying to create boundaries like that i'm curious um, if you all have any good tips for setting boundaries, if you do um, live in a house with other folks. So if you have a door, the rule is if it's closed, you're working. If it's open, you're available to chat. Um, 
it, when I was when I was living in an apartment, which I think is probably similar to a lot of the folks that are transitioning to work from home for the first time. Um, it was if I had headphones on or I was not available to talk or and the other thing that I didn't talk about was even when my kitchen nook slash office space was attached to my living room because it was a one 600 square foot one bedroom. Um, the desk was faced away from the television, so I didn't see fun while I was working. This was also very key. So um, when you're facing away from fun, that means you're not available for fun as opposed to like when if you're open for a conversation, you can turn your chair around or you mosey into the dining room or the living room or whatever you happen to have in your in your apartment setup. Yeah, I've, Very, I've, I've done the, the chair pointing thing too. Um, I took a recliner and pointed it at the corner like I was sitting in timeout. And that did a really good job of keeping me in the zone. Mine was a little less awkward than that, but had the same effect. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, something with our current situation that we're definitely um, finding that a lot of people haven't had to deal with is a good portion of our company is made up of parents. Um, and I know I've seen a lot of um, questions and people sharing different educational tools or different things because kids are out of school right now. So I'm curious, our resident parent, Matt, um, what are some kind of high level important things that a remote parent might need to know as they're transitioning um, to working remotely right now? Yeah, you know, so Working from home for me may be a little different. I, I certainly respect the difference of folks in marketing and engineering and other roles because when I'm working from home, a lot of times I'm still not in the home. I'm I'm traveling to customers or, uh, you know, in a hotel room or or something like that. But when I am here, and certainly during the summer months when the kids are home, and now when the kids are home, um, it, you know, the first thing I'd say is just patience. Uh, you know, there's going to be loud kids and people getting to the door, you know, deliveries and the dogs barking right in the middle of the most important call of the day. Uh, it, it just always happens that way. Uh, fortunately, we live in a, in a society, in a work world now where that's okay. Ever since that BBC, you know, video became viral and the kids are in the background of the reporter, it, everybody's kind of realized that that's just okay um you know and, and you've got to be all right with that it's times where it's really stressful and you're in an important discussion or your head's down in the middle of something and somebody comes into the room and they don't realize that you know the door is closed and you've got your earbuds in um and you've just got to take a deep breath and you know kind of kind of get through it without uh uh you know being frustrated um but i would also say that you know over time uh, it gets better. Don't expect the, the people around you to comply with the fact that you've got to work from home in the first 24 or 48 hours. <laughs> it's it's going to take a little while, you know, for people to realize that there's a parameter outside your door where it's really better if they're a little quiet, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and, you know, again, for the folks that are single parents or have all their kids under the age of five, you know, it's, that's hard. And, and I, you know, and I think you, you're just going to have to get super creative and again, be patient. Um, you know, but uh, it, it's, you know, it's about having that patience, working with people and, and, and making incremental progress every day. And now, you know, again, after seven years, I've gotten to a point where they realize that bouncing the ball against my office door, you know, in the middle of the day is probably not the best idea. And, you know, and, and um, you know, and, and, you know, there, there are also days, though, where at noon we can go for a walk or do something outside for 10 or 15 minutes, uh, you know, and when they're home. And, and that's good, too. So uh, patience and time, you know, that's what I would say. Awesome. Matt, thank you for sharing. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit, um, remote work can be kind of isolating. Um, so I'm curious for those of you who have been working remotely, um, how do you keep engagement with the rest of the company um, from waning over time? Uh, Raphael. Um, I have a um, 
personality that requires me to be isolated from other people as a matter of course. So maybe I'm not mm. the, the ideal person, but it also it was also a factor to teach me that I need to manage this actively very early on, even before I started working remotely. And the um, the reality is that it's uh, it's something you can schedule. You can say that engagement is something that you're going to uh, evaluate about yourself, like how are you feeling about starting working every day or maybe checking with yourself every month or every three months and then um, involve coworkers. Is this either a manager or a peer you're close to? Can we have um, like trying to orient the conversation? How are you actually uh, feeling about work these days? And and uh, what do you like about what you're doing? What is the uh, what kind of uh, how do you know at the end of the week whether you had a good week at work? And then um, through that conversation, identify the parameters that uh, define your personal value of engagement and then evaluate how it changes over time. And the, uh, the actor to, uh, to keep control over it and, and st stay stimulated in that way for me has been uh, traveling. Um, both traveling to the place where other coworkers can be found, but also uh, ensuring that I have enough vacation away from home on a regular basis, away from the place which happens to be my workplace. <laughs> That's actually important here. I could uh, go, for example, weekends and visit my family, which is totally not a vacation, uh, but it will serve as a way for me to come back to the office and think, well, actually, that work thing is actually pretty good, all things considered. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, Keith. Um, so I have a couple of things. I have a, I try to keep in touch with folks on Slack a lot. Um, and of course I have the, the most of the folks that I work with daily are also remote workers. So, you know, a lot of times it helps to just pick up the phone and call somebody for 10 minutes. Um, I also tend to do really silly stuff. Like I have a green <laughs> screen and we'll throw stuff up on the background occasionally or, um, you know, on the team call on Tuesday, if anyone noticed, I was wearing a paper bag over my head because I thought that would be of fun. Course. <laughs> so, um, you know, things that I find amusing that I hope other folks find amusing, I think helps a lot. Um, you know, the other piece of it really is to um, uh, is to make that effort, right? You've got to, it, whatever works for you, you've got to, you've got to kind of treat that as part of your job. Um, even if it's, silly or not silly or uh, you can tell those of us that have been working home for a, for a long time have um have uh, uh more serious setups for these uh types of um you know speaking and video camera type uh type setups right um you know that helps a lot too because you know when you're when you're taking meetings all the time it's good to be able to see folks and turn on the cameras and you know sometimes i don't want folks seeing the mess that's behind me. So you got to have an option for that too. So <laughs> that's great. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, something that I am running into right now is the absence of body language in remote conversation. It's great when we can be on a video call like this um, and I can see Lauren's nodding her head. So she's like, yes, I get this. Um, but in like Slack messages and asynchronous conversation, we don't really have that. So I'm curious how you all have dealt with that and if you have any strategies um, for working with that. I think I've got an idea here, so I will jump in. Yes. Um, one of the things that I saw as a tip, as I've just been perusing a ton lately, was to read communications with a smile. Because when you put that smile on your face, it changes the way you interpret things and you just may have a better understanding of what's actually coming through written. I have also found myself in situations this week where I said, uh, can we put a pause on this conversation until we can connect in a better format? Because I could see things starting to unfold and I knew that we weren't on the same page and it was important for me to put that pause right into the conversation early. Mm -hmm. That's great. I like the idea of reading with a smile. Yeah, I have to be acutely aware when you're writing as well that the language that you use is going to be subject to the other person projecting whatever they're feeling at that time. If they're stressed, if they're angry, if they're feeling insecure, 
they're going to read your words a lot more harshly than you may have ever intended them to read. And, you know, if you're like me and, you know, smart ass, uh, sometimes <laughs> you'll, you'll things that are perhaps not, uh, would perhaps be insulting if somebody were, didn't realize it's a joke. So uh, I, I myself have to rein myself in when I'm typing to people. In a non-business writing, I use lots of emojis. I, I just add that, you know, there are very few things that need to be responded to in 10 seconds. So I would say sometimes it makes sense to read something. And then if you don't quite get the text or the context rather of, of how they're wait and, and maybe wait five minutes and go read it again. And then, you know, again, if you're compelled to respond in, in a way that, you know, that is, you know, that, that maybe you didn't understand or whatever, I, I agree with Lauren's, you know, uh, take on this, just call a time out and say, Hey, let's, let's get together on a call or find some time where we can you know talk about this because, um, sometimes quick responses when you don't quite understand the perspective can really snowball into something that you don't want it to. I think that's great. And I like that these are all really easy to implement solutions. I can read stuff with a smile. That's not bad. Um, well, great, you all. How do you define your effectiveness and success as a remote employee? Um, if it differs from being in a co-located position. So kind of to Bob's point, once you get through the trough of getting used to working from home, you will then become a full workaholic for a period of time where you feel like no one realizes how hard you're working. And so you're going to get nervous and then you're going to do twice as much as you would before and stress yourself out. And then, you'll realize that that's, you can't maintain that. And then um, things will kind of come to an equilibrium. Um, this is one of those spots where just kind of figuring out a way to make sure that the team knows what you're working on, um, whether that's your manager or your peers or whatnot, I think is really helpful. Um, whether that's a, you know, a weekly team call where everybody goes around the horn and says, hey, what'd you get done last week? What'd you get done this week? What do you need help from the team for, with uh, or whatever works for whatever part of the organization that you're in? Those are those tend to be pretty helpful um, on on the field team. You know, we're, we tend to be pretty experienced folks. Right. And we've all been doing this for a while. And the vast majority of us are working remotely anyway. So we're all kind of used to that lack of feedback. But when I was first moving into a uh, kind of a, a field role where I was working out of my house, either part-time or full-time, I was very nervous about it. And those were the things that helped quiet the, the little goblin in my brain that was telling me <laughs> that I wasn't getting enough done. Awesome. Yeah. I'll second Keith about the, when you're working in a vacuum chamber, it's very easy to, to get caught in your own thoughts about, am I doing enough? And the way I got through that was I decided I'm only going to do one useful thing a day. So I'd go to work and I would do my one useful thing. And then it was, you know, 935 and I had time to do something else useful. But I always <laughs> knew at the end of the day, I'd done at least one useful justify still having a paycheck. And if you have good management, they will let you know when something is going wrong. I think the but, other thing to keep in mind, sorry, I thought you were done, Bob. Uh, but if your management is busy, uh, they often say, yep, so-and-so is doing a good job. Don't have to check in with them. So you can usually take silence as at least tacit agreement that you're doing a good job. Uh, I'll, I'll also add that when you're not in an office and you aren't distracted all the time by folks swinging by your desk and asking if you want to grab coffee or the whatever snack somebody put out in the, the kitchen or whatnot, um, you can get the same amount of work done in a lot of cases a lot faster than you necessarily would have if you had been in an office setting and remembering that it's okay to pace yourself and take breaks and whatnot um, really helps feel like you've accomplished things because 
you know, if you blast through all the stuff that you would normally do in a day in a couple of hours, and then you've got an hour downtime before your next meeting, it's okay to take a break. You don't, you don't have to force yourself to work through that, that kind of lull if you don't want to. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so this next question has to do a little bit more with our our current situation, the shift that a lot of folks are going through to working from home for the first time. Um, so how do you recognize and acknowledge or embrace the effects of change on your mood, on your mental health? I know I talked a little bit about how it can be isolating at times. And I know that with our, our current situation, there's definitely some extenuating circumstances probably affecting um, folks' mood. But I'm curious, um, for those of you who have adjusted to remote work before, um, how do you work with that change on your mental health? So one of the things you, you have to accept and you know learn to learn to deal with is that if you're working in relative isolation, and you know, especially if you live alone and people aren't going out of doors, that if you are already, you know, dealing with mental illness, depression, anxiety, what have you, you need to be aware that things might get worse for you. That if you if you don't have those daily interactions that make you feel like an honest to God human being and not just a, a meat robot, that you can get stuck in your own head a lot more easily because there's there aren't those distractions to break you out and realize, oh yeah, other people do like being around me. I can make people laugh. So that's that's a you check in with yourself a lot. If you do live with other people, um, you know, make sure that you're you're checking in with them and that you're continuing to behave like an honest to god human being. I'd I'd add to that is is try to you know try to keep your routine as as much as you can. Um, e even for people that would normally go into an office every day, you probably found yourself now with about an hour and a half in the morning and maybe an hour in the afternoon that you're not commuting. What are you doing with that extra time? And and so I would say try to find productive uses for that time, whether it's exercising or reading or whatever you can do in your in your space or or in the city under the constraints that you're in uh try to do that and and don't just take that time and you know watch tv or sleep in an extra hour or so certainly sleep you know and and all of those other things to maintain your health are important uh but try to keep that routine as as best you can because that will keep you you know in in a you know, in a semblance of, of your regular, you know, regular life. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, it, it just keeps you, you know, uh, uh, grounded to what you've always, you know, been doing. I was going to say that I think it can help to name what's happening, whether that's naming emotions, naming situations, and what I mean by that is I was talking to someone and they said, oh, I've been feeling really agitated. And I thought that was actually really healthy just to identify the emotion that's behind that. I think that that can help you move forward past what you're dealing with. And it also in this current situation can help us acknowledge that what we're dealing with is not going to be forever. It's a moment and we can acknowledge that, name it and move forward. The um, the things that you just said, uh, Lauren, are um, probably uh, uh, undervalued. Um, the uh, skill to name your emotions is not trivial, uh, but is extremely powerful. Uh, and it's especially if you live alone and you don't interact with people a lot, it's actually not exactly easy to have that kind of conversation. It's not it's not something people are used to say if they don't have someone to ask first. Um, so, uh, I, I, one, one thing that I will just say here, I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's probably not that obvious. It is something that belongs to the workplace. It's not a personal topic and it's not, is there a parameter of this is that of course, 
um, we are talking about um, uh, dealing with this as a group and we want to care about each other and so on. So there is a part of that. Some people even have friends at the workplace. But there is another thing here going on, which is that um, when when the, uh, the distance, social distancing causes us to lose a lot of our structure, social events, social going out, seeing people even on the street, even people you don't otherwise talk to, um, it is going to be the case that the, uh, the uh, direct coworkers you're going to relate with are going to be um, the people you start, you start maybe talking to, to the most in terms of hours per week um, compared to your previous life. And if those people uh, are not invested in caring about your emotional well-being, then you risk experiencing a degradation of how much emotional engagement you have with your social circle around you. And even though it's temporary, that loss is extremely painful and can cause a lot of damage, like things that are going to weigh on your mind for a long time afterwards. And so in order to avoid the situation, it's, it's reasonable and it's even uh, probably a good idea to engage with coworkers on that conversation, even if it feels awkward at the beginning, just as a matter of uh, emotional and psychological well-being and hygiene. That's great. Thank you all for sharing about that. I know that that is, especially right now, one of the trickiest pieces of this. Yes, clap, 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 Terry says. Um, I'm curious, what would you say to someone who feels like uh, this transition is preventing them from meeting previous expectations or if something's weighing heavily on them, how would you all address that? I think that someone who feels that they are not meeting expectations or that or that the new situation has changed, what they're able to do is is absolutely right. I mean, your your life today has been upended somewhat with the travel restrictions, with not going outside. Everybody's life has been thrown for a loop, and it is absolutely reasonable to say that I am operating on a different level during this transitional period. And as long as you're making that good faith effort to communicate about what's going on to other people, you can manage those expectations. And it doesn't have to be you know, oh, I'm I'm a completely worthless human being right now. I it's like, hey, I've I'm working from home. I've got a 20 square foot apartment. I can either sit or stand, and that's it. And if you communicate that, we'll all understand. Oh, your in in your uh, your difficulty mo modifier is is a five, you know, versus mine where it's like it's business as usual for me. I'm I haven't been affected by this stuff. So you know, communicate. And we are all, at least most of us, are pretty reasonable human beings and uh, want to help you. So, you know, my, my piece of word of advice here would just be rather than waiting until, it's, until you know that you can't do something or missing a deadline, raising your hand early, right? And saying, hey, I'm not going to be able to meet XYZ date or XYZ obligation because X, I need help, right? Um, I think that's probably more important than even getting stuff done is making sure that if you can't get something done, that there's kind of an early warning signal so that other people can help, right? It's okay to ask for help. That's totally fine, right? Like we all need help sometimes. Um, what you don't want to do is try to hide the fact that you're not going to meet those obligations. That's what causes like long-term relationship damage when you've let someone down and they didn't know that, that you weren't going to be able to do what you had originally promised to do for them. Yeah, that, that communication is, is really important because it's easy to just assume right now because of everybody kind of being in a, in a similar situation that, oh, well, everybody's you know standard has has changed or everybody's uh, ability to um you know complete their deliverables uh is changing um but you know i, I think I, I think you're right i think over communicating and sharing that information and the fact that we are 
increasing the number of weekly meetings that we're having and, and conversations that we're having is really good uh, because it, it enables people to, to step up and say, I need help, or, you know, this is going to take a little longer than we originally thought it was going to because people aren't around or aren't available. And, and just bringing that to, uh, to the front uh, faster is important. I really value what you guys have been saying here as a newbie to this full remote thing. Um, the other thing that I have done recently is, and I can't remember who suggested this on Slack, but it was to prioritize like three to five things that I wanted to do that day and then really focus in on those. And I know Bob mentioned that a few minutes ago, but I'm finding that that is kind of my do or die right now is if I get up in the morning and I itemize what has to be done, I'm much more successful. And I also feel more successful because I've been clear with myself. I'd like to echo that actually. One of the best pieces of advice that I got while I was an undergrad was just do one thing. Um, and I know Bob hit on this and Lauren, you just did, but that feeling of accomplishment, if you kind of have analysis paralysis, like I have, I have 50 different things that I need to do today. I'm not sure which one to start. Pick one, pick the easiest one, um, do something and just finish it, do it until it's done. And then you can work on something else. Uh, I saw Jim just said that on the marketing team, we all try to outline working on today on our team Slack channel every day. I think that's really valuable, making sure that as a lot of us are experiencing this for the first time, we're maintaining communication, um, we're writing everything down. If you have a question, writing that down, writing the answer down, putting it on the wiki, sharing it with as many people as you can, because as we are documenting everything, um, which Cockroach Labs has a great you know, history of as new people come into the company, or maybe you have a question that someone else has already answered, you can access that really easily and we can all learn from each other's questions. So I think that's great. Um, I guess my, my question to wrap this up before opening it up to uh, everyone else in case people in the chat have some questions for these folks. Um, what are some things that nobody told you about remote work that you wish you would have known when you were just starting out? I'll so, jump in. Go ahead, oh. Keith. Oh, so I was just going to say that um, under normal circumstances, I have a like a small cadre of other local folks that work from home, and we we have like a weekly lunch that we get together and do. I know that that's not a super helpful piece of advice for right now. Maybe you could do a socially distant lunch where everybody goes to a park and sits six feet away from each other and yells at each other, but. Uh, you know, that's, that's something that particularly when I'm not traveling for a week, that's something that I, I find is a, is a good kind of way to reconnect with people. And it kind of helps my mental sanity doing a lot of this stuff. I think that the, the lesson I wished I had known 10 years ago was take care of yourself first. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of others and you can't take care of your business. I, I was going to say video on, you know, uh, I, I've, uh, I've worked from home for you know, seven, eight years now. And for the first part of that, I worked for companies that used other, you know, uh, conference technology that, that had video capability, but they didn't always use it. You know, and and most of the time we were just these kind of faceless voices on on uh, on conference calls. And the last company I worked for, it was mandatory, and and it didn't really matter if you were in your pajamas or you had a bad hair day or you're eating lunch. Video was on, and as much as that was uncomfortable, at, you know, at the beginning, and it was certainly uncomfortable for new people coming into the company, it really helps with the connection, and it helps to see the other people that you're working with or see the other people that are in your company or see your, your customers or your prospects. Uh, sometimes they're off put by the video on, but then three or four minutes into the call, they're flip their camera on uh, and, and it's no big deal. And they've got dogs and kids in the background too. And so, you know, I, I would just say that if you're uncomfortable with that, give it a try. 
and and try to get comfortable with it because it really helps with the connection uh, and the sense of community uh, when you're you know when you're working remote. Raphael, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Uh, the others have covered all the grounds that I thought I was, think I was thinking about. And I think that the, uh, the only uh, topic that maybe we haven't really emphasized yet, and I would have liked to know that earlier, uh, to realize that earlier, the amount of uh, energy that we spend physically in commute um, is actually providing us a baseline amount of exercise on top of whatever exercise routine you already have. And if you don't overcompensate in your exercise routine for that energy you didn't you you didn't realize you were spending over a day, uh, that's going to have consequences on on your well-being uh, and your metabolism. So I would say exercise more than usual as a result of the change. Super helpful. Any of our other panelists? That was an amazing insight, Raphael. I super agree. Uh, and I love, I've seen in, um, yeah, the air squad challenge, people in Slack have been doing um, workout challenges, which I think is cool. And it's some, some team building along the way. Um, awesome, so I'd like to flip it around to if anyone um, in the chat has any questions for these folks or maybe um, some tips you'd like to share, the floor is open. And also, maybe not, you all crushed it. Um, one thing that I found, I um, joined a working remote training Zoom call um, recently. And one of the companies that I was talking has a rule where um, if it has to take three slacks to communicate something, it's a call. So like three slacks equals a call, I think is interesting. Um, it might not always be useful, but it's nice to be able to hop on a call and hear someone's voice or uh, taking a page out of Matt's book, video on, you can see their face and see um, some body language. So awesome. You all, I think this has been super helpful. Any uh, last thoughts um, for folks on the panel? I, I, I wanted to suggest something, uh, which is to create an, um, an additional open office hour to ask practical questions on individual workplace situations. Um, I have a, a personal interest slash curiosity in um, uh, optimizing uh, in interior design for uh, setting up a, a workplace in a uncomfortable home situation. Uh, I've done it before multiple times and I've seen it done successfully so I can share some hints. Um, and so I'm, I'm absolutely available to do that. And then I suppose there might be additional questions we, ha we haven't answered today, and maybe we can follow up uh, in another weekly session that would be opt-in and, and answer more questions. Awesome. Hey, I just want to make a quick comment that I think it is really generous that the company is affording us a, an allowance to get your home office in, in some type of shape. Um, don't just say, all right, well, I have that money, but I'm not going to need it. I'll just tough it out with my folding chair and my TV table for my computer. And, you know, I'll just make it work. Um, get comfortable, uh, you know, get to a point where you can operate in your office. For those of us that, you know, that have been doing this for a while, you know, we got a desk from this company and a chair from this company and a printer from this company. And, you know, over time, you've accommodated, you've accumulated this stuff. Uh, but if you're new at this, you probably don't have a, a lot of this stuff. And and so as much as you can, and I know it's not easy to run out to Best Buy or Staples or wherever now, but get get a few things that, that just make it easier to operate. And you, you'll feel a lot better uh, about how you get through an eight hour day or a 10 hour day or a six hour day or whatever day you're, you're working. As I can tell, Evan needs to take that advice. He's looking down at his computer. Yeah, I y'all just need, roasting my setup right now. You need now. to look at or um, up to your computer for ergonomics. So get yourself a monitor so that the so that things are higher than you are, not lower. That will 
stop you from having neck pain at the end of the day. If that means you need to get an external keyboard and monitor and mouse, make sure you do that. We don't want you uh, being in pain. Thank you, Keith. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, Celia just asked if there's a place where people are sharing um, their gear and their setup. Uh, it's the nodes channel on Slack. Um, and I think that will be a good place, uh, Raphael, um, for you to post about some consultations and office hours. Very cool. Any other last thoughts from folks? All right. Thank you all so much for participating. And for those of you um, watching, this has been great. Uh, I'm going to send this out to the notes channel. And like Sherry said, we'll see you all online. Thanks so much. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, y'all. Bye, y'all.